Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Accelerate Yale webinar on navigating and thriving in remote work environments. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Wendy Maldonado D'Amico, and I'm Yale College class of 1993. And I am a member of the Accelerate Yale leadership team. We're delighted to have this evening's webinar co-sponsored by Yale Women and Careers Life in Yale and made possible by Yale, shared, Yale Alumni Association's shared interest groups. Before introducing our speaker and moderator, I'd like to review a few operational items with you. First, please know that this webinar is being recorded. Keep that in mind because the chat will also be recorded and all participants on the webinar are muted. Second, if you go to the bottom bar of your screen, you'll see some buttons at the bottom. There are two that I'm going to ask you to pay attention to. First, you'll see two double bubbles um, toward the middle labeled Q&A. That is where we would like you to submit any questions that you have for the speaker. Um, if you, uh, then if you go across the bar a little to the right, you'll see another bubble labeled chat. In chat, that's a place where you can chat with other participants on the webinar. Um, if you pose a question there, just know that it won't be answered in the Q&A session at the end of the webinar after Catherine speaks. Uh, so please work to keep all of your questions in the Q&A double bubbles. Uh, let's see here. So the webinar will last one hour and we're going to reserve the last 25 minutes for your questions. And now I would like to introduce Grace Shia, uh, our moderator for the session. Grace is Yale College class of 2007 and she is a co-founder of Accelerate Yale. Her 13 years of marketing and operations advice uh, experience um, to senior leaders uh, have spanned multiple sectors across the North American, Asian, European, and Latin American markets. Grace. Thank you, Wendy. I'm delighted to introduce our featured speaker for this evening, Catherine Stewart. Catherine, Yale College class of 2005, is the Chief Business Officer at Automatic, the company behind WordPress.com. At Automatic, she built the company's go-to-market functions, including marketing, inside sales, partnerships, and corporate development. This work contributed to growing the company's valuation from $1 billion to 2014, to $3 billion in 2019. Previously at Facebook, Catherine helped launch the ad tech business unit and led the three-year planning process. Prior to that, she helped Random House transition from selling physical to digital books and was a strategy consultant at McKinsey. Catherine received an MPhil from the University of Cambridge and a BA from Yale, where she graduated summa cum laude and was the recipient of the Hilgendorf Fellowship. Catherine currently lives in San Francisco and in addition to her role at Automatic, serves as an advisor to several startups in the technology and media sectors. On a personal note, Catherine is a close friend of mine whom, I'm ha whom I've had the privilege to know for over 16 years. We played violin together in the same orchestra at Yale, which she also led as managing director. And like so many others who are joining this evening, I've been a longtime admirer of Catherine's. I'm thrilled she's here with us tonight to share her insights on navigating and thriving in the world of remote environments. So Catherine, thank you again for being with us here. Um, I think my first question would be, you know, for the past five and a half years, you've been a senior executive at a company of 1300 people who are distributed all across the globe. I'd love to start our conversation by asking you to share a bit of an overview of your perspective on remote work environments as both a business leader and a team member. Sorry, I'm <laughs> muted. But in any case, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, yes, it's been um, close to six years of, of managing remote teams. And um, it's been quite an adventure. And I have to admit that um, some of the elements were surprises, um, but it's also not so dissimilar for managing in other environments as well. It's just there's an additional component of communication, of paying attention to how people our feeling of trying to pick up on cues that may not be as obvious when you're in a distributed environment and communicating over Zoom or Slack. Um, yeah, I'd say at a high level, that's been the experience. So in this current COVID-19... By the way, just a technical thing. Can we mute 
um, the other participants on the call. Wendy, would you be able to do that? Great, thank you, Wendy. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> Thanks. I just heard some tea pouring. <laughs> I heard that as well. Thanks, Catherine. So um, my next question would be, you know, in this current COVID-19 climate, a lot of people who are used to more structured office environments are now having to adapt to working remotely. As someone who started her career as a management consultant before moving to the publishing sector and then to the tech industry, I'd love to learn how you navigated the transition to 100% remote work environment and you know, how you decided to join a company that didn't have any physical offices and what that transition was like, if there were any unexpected challenges that you had to contend with. I have to admit that when I was joining Automatic, it was, um, it was not inspired by the fact that the company was remote. So I figured that I would, um, that was part of the experience and that I would learn to adapt. And, um, and so I have, um, it certainly is, um, it, it certainly is a little different. And as I alluded to in the last question, I think one of the biggest challenges is around as many people on this call are going to be experiencing now that we're pretty much all working remote, um, is some of these interpersonal connections that it's much easier to build team um, team camaraderie and interpersonal relationships when you're in person at least some of the time um, so i want to say that even for us even though we are used to operating fully remotely and we have 1300 employees spread out of, across many countries that this has been an adjustment for us that we're not used to having people who have to work at home rather than from a co-working space or um, who may not have a strong Wi-Fi because all of their neighbors are also using the Wi-Fi and streaming Netflix and they <laughs> used to rely on the local coffee shop instead of their home office or people who have children at home and don't have the childcare options that they used to have. And so all of these um, are challenges for us as well as I know for probably many, many people on this call and we're adjusting. We're doing the best we can. Um, these are extraordinary times and we're working through them. Great, thank you. Um, and Catherine, can you share what a typical day looks like for you in sort of more normal circumstances um, and, and how you structure your working hours? If you have a home office that you work out of, I know you mentioned, you know, sort of co-working spaces, coffee shops, would love to hear you know, sort of what your experience has been in terms of structuring your work life. I have to admit that um, I do have a lot of meetings. <laughs> Like even, even on a, a normal day, there are meetings, um, at least one or two of them are out of the house. Um, of course, not today, <laughs> not now, but on the average day, um, that has been a part of my day to day. Our legal team, for example, is here in San Francisco. Uh, many, many people from our finance team are here. So if you can meet in person, we often do. Um, we try to document everything so that if you are in a hub, as San Francisco is, where other we call ourselves automaticians, where other people from automatic are working, that you don't develop any subculture that could erode the overall. You don't want to have one place where it's sort of primary or better than any of the other locations where employees are working. Um, so I'd say that's, that's one thing is that um, usually there are meetings outside of the house. Um, and then there are um, a lot of Zoom meetings. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of Slack, a lot of Zoom, and then a lot of documentation. Because we are working remotely, even if you have an in-person meeting or if you have a Zoom meeting, somehow you want to make sure that what was discussed and what was decided is accessible to others in the company who may not have been able to be there. And um, that also helps when you're dealing with multiple time zones and geographies. So documentation is a key part of, of what we do. At Automatic, we have our own intranet that allows us to, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit like um, Facebook for work, but in our case, it's, it's WordPress. So we're using our own product mm -hmm. um, just for internal use. So each team has their own blog, essentially, and that allows us to also make decisions that are very public to others within the company and to share information in a way that's also searchable. So for example, if I'm having a meeting with Google, and I want to see who had a meeting recently, um, then I can do a search and, and find the meeting notes from, from prior, prior conversations. Great, thank you. 
And Catherine, could you share some key tools and tips that you found helpful as a remote worker? Um, I'd say first, face a window if you can. <laughs> um, sunlight, sunlight. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, this is actually not, we, I do have a home office that's much more ergonomic than this. I'm sitting at a dining room table, but this has the best light in the house. So if I'm doing a Zoom call, mm -hmm. um, I want to make sure that I'm facing a window as opposed to doing the godfather thing and presenting a silhouette. Um, <laughs> another thing is, is being, um, being audible. So uh, I know this is not the most stylish piece of equipment, but it works quite well for um, tuning out background information. Right. Uh, or background sounds and um, that's that's pretty helpful as well to the others on the call <laughs> so sure. this way if a si siren goes by on the street outside my window you will not hear it if you do let me know <laughs> <laughs> so I'd say there's some basic things um, in terms of you know not not tools but more um, more uh, I don't know subtle or sophisticated would be being thoughtful about um, the tone of what's being communicated when you're using text. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure if you're all used to using Slack in other contexts, then this is not a surprise, but if you're relatively new to, to Slack because you are in a more traditional work environment um, or any kind of text-based communication, um, what I've found is that um, a simple question such as, how is that project going? That could be meant in a very friendly way. When your tone of voice isn't associated with the text message and there's no facial expression it can easily be misinterpreted and someone else receiving it might see that as so what's how's that project going you right. know <laughs> with a note of concern or worry right. or um or doubt and so being aware that there can be that bias or that um i don't know that game of telephone with mm -hmm. with text and with emotion yeah i think it's it's pretty um pretty helpful to think through how a text-based message could be interpreted in various ways and to use lots of emoticons. Right, I was about to ask about emojis and how, you know, people have differing opinions on how professional they come across, but yeah. Over Slack, I think that they are highly useful tools. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I think, you know, transitioning now a little bit to your role as a leader within a company of, again, 1,300 people all around the globe, obviously operating on different time zones. I think even in uh, sort of more traditional work environments, there's often an expectation that one's always going to be on and accessible. And I'd love to understand from you, Catherine, as as a chief business officer, you know, how does that work from a pra practical standpoint? You know, do your colleagues understand that there are certain hours where you're not available to answer questions, even if you're awake and, and not asleep? Um, and, you know, how do you navigate that? I think it's very important to not only be sometimes off for your own sanity and well-being, but also to set an example for others at the company. Mm -hmm. um, there's what I say and there's what I do, but what I do will always speak louder. And I want my team to be happy, healthy, well-rounded individuals. So I need to set some boundaries myself to show that they can do the same. And so even if I am gonna be working over a weekend, unless it's something unusual, like we're preparing for a board meeting or we're working on an acquisition or something along those lines, um, I, I will hide myself on Slack so that others can't yeah. see that I'm doing that. And I encourage my team to, um, to make sure that they, they time bound. It's a little bit more complicated when you do have a team that's spread out across geographies, as you alluded to. Yeah. Because if you want your team to overlap, then somebody's going to suffer. Right. Um, and if you have enough geographies, if you have a team that's spread out between, say, Australia or Japan and the United States, and then we've got a couple people in Europe. Um, if you want everyone on the call at the same time, someone's really going to have to suffer. So I think it's important to think about um, when you're putting a team together, who, you know, where people are. Um, mm -hmm. I'm guessing that's less relevant to a lot of people on this call. But um, when, when you do have lots of ge or multiple geographies, I ask that everyone be willing to time shift, but just twice a week. 
mm-hmm. if there's nothing going on that requires time shifting, then um, maybe not even time shifting at all that week. But before they're before anyone's hired to automatic, I ask that they be willing to time shift. And based on their geography, I can already tell them if it will be mornings or evenings, and they can choose the days. And if it's not the Tuesday and Thursday that this person in France said he would be working, then I expect they will not be online in the evening. And if I see them online in the evening, I'll make sure that, um, you know, at some point later in our one-on-one, I might comment on that and make sure that they know that that's not expected or normal or standard. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, no, I started my career abroad in Beijing, as you know, and definitely was on a lot of midnight calls with Asia and Europe and the U.S. at the time. And um, I think it's great the way you sort of make it very clear to your team that, you know, it's not always expected that they're going to be working around the clock. And I'm sure it's very helpful in terms of, you know, sort of managing attrition and retention and um, team happiness. I think it's important. (laughs) I think it's very important. And then you also have the teams that will have um, challenging work-life balances because they work on deals. Maybe it's M&A, maybe it's partnerships. Um, So for those folks, if they have to work weekends for two months in a row because they're trying to buy a company, then um, I try to make sure that they take that time off somewhere else, Mm -hmm. that they properly take two weeks vacation, whether or not they even have plans of what to do with it. They just, I want them to not be online and to take a breather. Right. Um, I'm sure some of you work in industries that can have spiky hours that way and can relate. Right. Is automatic um, unlimited vacation or, or what's the policy on that front? It is unlimited. And I think that makes the importance of setting standards, social standards, even even more critical. Mm -hmm. Because unlimited, at least when you say we have four weeks or we have two weeks, then everyone knows what that means. And they know that taking up to that amount is completely acceptable. When you have unlimited, I think that people are even more attentive to social cues. Right. Absolutely. Right. I think there's been a lot of discussion, particularly in the tech industry, as to Unlimited actually means people take fewer vacation days, right? Because there aren't those cues and you don't have to use X number of days by the end of the year. Right. And you're not paid out for them at the end if you don't take them. Right. Um, Another challenge we have um, with employees all over the world is um, uh, what's what's considered normal. (laughs) Um, If you're in the U.S., um, you may consider that two weeks or three weeks is is what you're aiming to take over the course of the year and if you're in france you might be (laughs) you might consider normal to be quite a bit more so figuring out how to balance that especially when you have teams that are split between different countries um i think is important to to address and to get ahead of absolutely and you know on the topic of team member happiness um, i'd love to understand a little bit more about how you think about promotions, um, particularly within a remote work environment. I think oftentimes a lot of us, when we are thinking about working towards that next level within a company, we think about FaceTime, we think about sort of the importance of being the first one in, the last one out, and, um, you know, sort of managing that process. And would love to get your perspective on how you decide on, you know, which team members to promote, um, you know, what your recommendations are for um, employees who are looking to uh, move up the ranks in an, in a remote workplace. In some ways, I think that being in a remote or distributed environment um, is healthy because you don't have the same expectations around FaceTime and results and performance speak more for themselves. And, um, I think that um, when, you, when you have people who can be judged entirely on what they've achieved, in some ways, that's really nice. You don't, you don't know what they're wearing every day. You don't know necessarily how they're looking on that average Tuesday because you happen to have no Zoom calls with them. And I think in some ways, that's a nice leveler. Mm-hmm. Um, in hiring, actually, I hired, um, this was years ago, but a woman who had a name that um, was not 
obviously female. Hmm. And um, when I was collecting feedback at the end of her whole loop, um, I realized that some people didn't actually know because they were using the gender pronoun he. I thought that was really, <laughs> I thought that was really interesting and, and nice in, in many ways that um, you could go through a whole hiring process. And if there's enough text-based communication, not everyone has actually spoken with the person that gender is completely irrelevant because people don't even know. Um, now, of course, it's less relevant in the day-to-day -day once you've been working with people. But um, yeah, we've, we've certainly um, hired, you know, we've, we've promoted plenty of people um, at Automatic and it's based on their results. It's based on what kind of manager they are, if they're in customer support, um, which we call happiness, by the way, happiness engineering. Um, then it. it's about, yeah, it's about how many of our customers they can bring joy to and resolve um, difficulties for. Um, or if it's for, um, if it's for an engineer, it's about the quality of the code that that person has produced and contributed. So it's, it's definitely an environment in which promotions, I think, are just as possible as one and that's not remote. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And you know, sort of looking at your workforce as a whole, you know, sort of um, looking at company culture and um, you know what it's like to try and maintain a culture without a physical space for team members to be gathering and you know sort of thinking about some of the benefits and challenges and you know, would love to understand Catherine if you you know have company gatherings I, you know you mentioned that this current environment has been challenging for your team as well because you know you do have in person meetings for employees who work in the same area would love to understand you know sort of what your thought processes on regional get-togethers, company-wide retreats, um, how you guys implement those? Yeah, we actually travel a lot. Um, it depends on what your role is within the company, how much you travel. Um, but the common assumption is that people who work in sales or partnerships are more likely to travel than people who work in engineering. For us, it's slightly different. Um, that is also true, but... Um, in general, the more teams you oversee, the more you'll end up traveling. So it's a slightly different scale. And then the reason for that is because um, we, we have a policy where each team gets together once a year. And that time is usually, say, four to five days, um, on the like, three to five days, we'll call it. And then we also have three conferences, one in Asia, one in the US usually, but somewhere in North America, and then one in Europe. And then we have a full company-wide get-together where everybody um, all gets together in, in one location. We've been doing Orlando, Florida recently. <laughs> but in any case, um, these trips start to add up because if you have, say, nine teams that you're overseeing and you attend all their meetups, and then if you have some partner teams, so for example, I do not oversee engineering, but if there's an engineering meetup, an offsite, then I will likely attend that so I can stay in touch. Um, and then there are executive team meetups, and those are more frequent. Those are at least once a quarter. And if you just add it up, it ends up being, um, I'd say, about 50 to 70% of the time on the road. Wow. So, um, it can be a lot, and it's definitely something that um, we've been thinking about because over time, as we grow, that doesn't continue to scale. So how do we adjust that policy? I, I wouldn't say we've entirely figured it out, but we have been playing with a lot of different um, ideas. For example, of maybe not doing a full company-wide meetup and maybe splitting it out into smaller, smaller units now that we have gotten so large. Right, thank you. Um, it, I have to know, is, is Disneyland usually part of those company retreats in Orlando? Uh, we did Universal Studios last year. <laughs> Sorry, Disney World. Yeah, of course. Very I get them mixed up all the time. <laughs> um, great. So, Catherine, prior to joining Automatic, you worked at Facebook, which is also known for having a very strong organizational culture. And, you know, would love your thoughts on, you know, assessing the culture at Automatic as compared to a company like Facebook. The cultures are very different, but... Um, when it comes to remote, the cultures are almost opposite because <laughs> Facebook uh, has placed historically a very strong emphasis on having everyone in one location. And what's interesting is that um, 
at some point, as I mentioned, that we are starting to find that we are outgrowing our current model of meetups once a year for every team and all company-wide gatherings. Facebook quickly outgrew that policy of everyone in one place because it simply doesn't scale over time. So the first thing to get relaxed, I joined Facebook in 2011, so about a year before the IPO. And at that time, we did have other offices, but they were almost exclusively for, um, for sales folks. Um, not entirely, but pretty close. So for example, there was a New York office, but no engineers were in the New York office. And over time, that policy had to get relaxed as Facebook wanted to grow um, and wanted to invest more and more in their talent and hiring people from Europe who wanted to stay in Europe, not move to Menlo Park. And even relaxed to the point where um, there's now an office in San Francisco. At first it was just for Instagram employees and then, then there was a softening even beyond that. And that was, that was quite a symbolic softening. And it happened actually after I left. There was no San Francisco office for anyone except for Instagram employees um, at the time when I left in 2014. So I think it's, it's, it's a part of any company. As you scale, you often have to change what you've known and the values you've held dear. Um, it's, it's just a reality. Um, now, even if you're working at Menlo Park for Facebook, you often can't get between the meetings. There's so many buildings right. that you can't actually get between all the meetings in time to be in, build in time in between meetings. meetings for traveling. And exactly. So know. even if you are in Menlo Park, you're doing a lot of calls by Zoom in any case. So companies are all, you know, we're all continuously reinventing ourselves and figuring out what works for the next stage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, Catherine, before moving to audience questions, I'd love to hear your perspective on the potential for remote work as a larger continuing trend, you know, even after things return to some semblance of normal. And, uh, you know, are there specific companies um, and types of companies that you feel are strong models for remote work? Yeah, a lot of companies are going remote. And even before COVID-19, um, became the, <laughs> the pandemic that it now is, uh, more and more companies seem to be moving towards a remote work environment. I think things often come in, come in and out of fashion. Mm -hmm. um, when I first joined Automatic, it seemed um, very odd to a lot of people that I would work for a company that was fully remote. And I noticed that starting about a year ago, I, I started getting a lot of calls from people saying, look, I'd like to make my startup um, follow a remote model. We're not currently, I'd like to move towards one or I'm about to start a company and I want it to be remote, can we talk? And I just found that really interesting. I don't know that there's a perfect model for really anything, <laughs> at least not, not something as complex as um, you know, building uh, a successful company and culture. But um, I do think that there are pros and cons. And so depending on what you're trying to optimize for as a CEO or leader, there are different approaches that you might want to take. Mm -hmm. Got it. And um, finally, I understand that uh, you've recently accepted the position of COO at Shippo. Congratulations um, for Thank those you. of us on the line who aren't familiar with Shippo. It's a company that powers shipping for e-commerce merchants. And um, so, Catherine, even though Shippo is not a remote um, you know, workplace, are there elements that you've learned from Automatics culture as a globally distributed company that you're hoping to bring with you to Shippo in your new role? Well, for better or for worse, um, almost all companies are remote for now, <laughs> whether they want to be that way or not, or intend right. to be that way for the long term. So yes, um, I'm glad I do have some experience in a remote environment because it is a bit daunting to start with a completely new cast of characters, not having ever met them in person. Some of them I've met in person, but many of them I haven't. And I do think that's suboptimal. I would prefer to be able to meet them in person. Right. Um, but we are where we are. And so we'll do the best with what we've got. Right. Fantastic. Catherine, thank you so much. Um, I think we'll stop the portion of the conversation here and open the floor up to questions from all of you who are joining this evening. I'll hand the floor back over to my Accelerate Yale colleague and friend, Wendy Maldonado D'Amico, who will be managing the live Q&A portion of this evening. 
Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Catherine. Okay, so we have lots of great questions in the queue, and I'm just going to remind all participants that if you do want Catherine to answer your question, please use the Q&A box um, in the bottom bar of your screen, and you guys actually have been really great about that. So, um, first question is from Kathy Douglas. Uh, what is the one or two top skills or technologies you would recommend that students focus on immediately to prepare for remote work upon graduation? I think that remote work is easier in some contexts than in others. And for example, a lot of what I was describing about the friction um, is probably more applicable, or the challenges, is more applicable to people who are currently managing large teams or doing a lot of collaborative work. Like I think remote brainstorming is, is somewhat hard. Whereas if you're working as an individual contributor, um, in some ways it can be a breath of fresh air to not have people stopping by your desk and bothering you with questions potentially. So I've found that um, remote work is often most popular with people whose jobs um, are a bit more self-contained. And so if you're an engineer, um, if remote work is a high priority, studying engineering might be a really good way to go <laughs> as one example. So I'd say that it in part depends on um, if you've already chosen your profession of choice or not. But if you haven't, um, lots of people seem to um, build successful careers and work remotely if what they do is something that um, is, is fairly self-contained. Excellent, okay, thank you. The next question is from Barbara Geddes. Barbara says the following, I am an architect who is now running a studio remotely. We have to look at drawings together and collaborate and mark them up together. We are using Zoom now. There are now security concerns, as you know. Would Slack work for creative collaboration when you have to look at a mutual work product together and alter it in real time? This is essential to how I work with others. There's far too much talking these last two weeks and less drawing. Zoom versus Slack versus something else? What do you have to say about that? Or to yeah, that? that's a tough one. Um, and this actually gets to what I was describing in the last question as well, which by the way, Kathy just um, added a comment to clarify. But I think that yes, collaboration is, is simply harder in a remote environment and I haven't found the perfect solution. Um, you can try online collaborating tools. There are a number of design products out there that you can try out. I'm not a designer, so I can't give too much of a, of a rating or a review for them. But I do know that Miro is one um, that a lot of folks are using and, and have, have liked. It allows for someone to create a mock-up and then someone else to interact with that mock-up and add to it. Um, I would suggest doing a bit of an online search because I'm guessing for architecture, there are going to be more bespoke solutions that um, are probably even better for what you're describing. Um, I have sometimes resorted to the old way of just drawing something and then sharing it <laughs> and I also have um, a whiteboard that um, it's basically a roll-up whiteboard so you can just buy it on Amazon it'll arrive in probably a month but <laughs> um, and then you paste it to your wall it's sticky and you grab some markers and then you can actually whiteboard um, you know wherever you may be and I found that to be, it's a hack, it's not perfect, but it's certainly better than, um, it's, it's certainly better than just trying to describe in words an idea that you could draw in 20 seconds. Excellent, thank you. The next question is from Adam Brenner. How do you allow associates to manage up when they don't see you and understand everything that's on your plate? I try to be very transparent about what is on my plate, so I write weekly updates that are visible to the entire company that describe what I'm working on and why and how I spent my time. A lot of people, um, I actually don't do this now, but I, I will going forward, have completely visible calendars as well. So you can see all the meetings you're, so that your team can see all of the meetings that you're having and, um, and not only when you're busy or free, but exactly how you're spending your time. Um, I think it's, it's important as well to make sure that the team's in the loop, not just as to the blocking and tackling that you're doing, because everyone's busy, we're always busy, but, but the higher level why. So um, making sure that it's really clear, look, 
for the next three months, I am focused on hiring and I am focused on, let's just say, um, 2020 COVID-19 response, <laughs> like what the plan is going to look like, whatever it might be. And have that be very clearly communicated so that everybody knows these are my top two priorities. It doesn't mean I'm not talking about other topics with other people um, or working on other things as they come up, but this is, this is mission critical. I think that can help a lot as well. Thank you. The next question is from Constance Royster. What is your experience or advice on platforms other than Zoom? And please keep in mind this, your answer is not for attribution. Um, I've used Google Hangouts. Um, I've used BlueJeans. I used BlueJeans back when I was at Facebook. Google Hangouts more socially. Um, I like Zoom. I think it's more reliable. Does that mean it's perfect? Definitely not. But I've found it to be enough for most of my needs. And I have found it to be much more consistent and reliable than the other options. So. I prefer it. I guess I've also used WebEx, but I feel like that's not very common these days. Thank you. The next question is from an anonymous attendee. Here's the question. Do you see a difference in managing stakeholders and relationships between working remotely internally versus externally? So for example, with clients. So, you know, as an example, have you had clients whom you used to meet in person, but then you had to transition to more remote meetings? And was there a change in the quality of that relationship? I actually find that it's a lot easier to go from uh, an in-person relationship to one that is not than it is to develop it entirely remotely. Um, because at least you have some experiences, um, some goodwill, some trust that you can draw on. Um, this happens to me actually frequently where you'll develop a relationship, whether it's internal or external, and then you'll go back to wherever it was you came from and um, you won't work together quite as closely in that way. I have found that that in-person interaction and that memory of that in-person interaction does go a long way. And that yes, it is good to refresh that. You don't wanna let it go indefinitely, but you can, you can get a lot of mileage um, in between those in-person interactions. Excellent. The next question is from Kathy Douglas. Do you have suggestions on how graduates with skills in remote work technologies sell themselves in job applications to organizations that don't currently have remote working systems in place? Hmm, I know Kathy's active on chat. So if you wanna clarify even further, wait, the question just say. disappeared. Oh, it did, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no worries. Uh, okay. um, yeah, I found it again. Okay. Um, sell themselves. I, I have a feeling that you probably have something fairly specific in mind. Um, like what kinds of organizations that don't have remote working systems in place. I come from a tech world, so I'm, I'm probably coming with a lot of assumptions and biases about what kinds of systems are in place. Um, so she's saying, I'm thinking about in this moment, students are on the market now. Um, I think if students can be more tech savvy, that is always helpful. If they're familiar with the commonly used tools and can switch between them with, with ease, then that will certainly set them up more for success. Um, it is a fairly level environment in that everyone's in the same boat. It's not as though one country is grappling with this and all the others are fine. It's, it's actually like pretty much widespread. So I think in that sense, while it's tough, it's probably at least tough for everyone. Um, I'm, I'm sure I could be wrong in, in some geographies or some areas or regions, but I would imagine that if you're a student who is graduating, um, at least all the, most of the other students will be in a similar situation. And so it's not as though there's one person who has that in-person meeting and can therefore get an edge. Um, we're sort of all in this, this situation together. Okay, excellent. All right, thank you. Okay, so we have a question from Cynthia Taub. Do you have any tips on how not to be distracted when working remotely? Um, I find that um, I can almost be myopic. It's both, a, it's both a blessing and a curse. One time I did try to cook in the middle of the day while I was at home and um, 
oh my goodness, that was a burned pot. <laughs> All I was trying to do was warm up soup and even that failed. So um, I, am, I am fortunate in that uh, I seem to um, be able to single task really well. <laughs> Um, but I do know that that is a common challenge that people um, experience. I like to block out time on my calendar for anything it is that I'm doing, um, whether it's work related or not. Um, sometimes when you're working from home, you can be distracted by home tasks. And sometimes when you're working from home, it can be the opposite where you just don't sort of shut down the laptop when the, the day is over and do tend to the things that you need to. Um, so I, I do like to, set very clear boundaries even before I start a day. I usually have blocked out all the meetings I'm doing when I'm preparing for a particular conversation. If there's something, something I need to respond to, someone sent me a document, they want feedback, I'll even include that on my calendar. So that way I can make sure there's time enough for everything that I'm committing to to do to actually get done. And um, that way I also don't have to think a lot during the day. Like I, I finish a meeting, I have a 20 minute break, and then, um, and then I, I immediately know <laughs> what was highest priority for me to work on so I don't even have to context switch that much or reprioritize that much in the moment. I found that really helpful. And honestly, I do the same thing with personal things. Um, I know that's gonna be harder for people who have kids at home right now um, without childcare. Um, so this is much more easily said than done. But, um, I've even sometimes scheduled laundry with myself. <laughs> like, look, I know this has to happen. I'm going to need to be home for a full two hour period to get the whole thing done. So between these meetings, I put it in and between these meetings, I take it out. <laughs> I schedule laundry with myself too, Catherine. Thank you. That <laughs> That's why you guys are friends. Uh, okay. Uh, I have a question from Amy, Amy Palin. What is your advice for starting a new job remotely? Oh, these are the times we're living in. Okay. Uh, well, I am doing the same thing. Uh, I start my new job in two and a half weeks. And the advice is, look, I've actually not done this before. So, because um, even with automatic, I traveled quite a bit in the beginning as I was getting up to speed. So you can take it for what it's worth. But um, just, just try to invest in Zoom conversations because at least Zoom is the most similar to in-person. Um, try to get to know people personally. It does feel more awkward when you're in a Zoom than it does when you're getting a coffee. But um, trying to create a little bit of space for people to tell you about themselves and for you to share about yourself. Um, and uh, I don't know, companies are getting more and more creative with things like open mic nights or um, happy hours that are all taking place over Zoom. It's not the same, but I think that when you're starting at a new company, investing in trying to get to know people um, as personally as you can is, is worth the effort. Excellent. So the next question is from Sam Hendel. Catherine, how do you me measure employee productivity in the remote environment? So for my teams, it's, it's not actually that hard because um, there's a task or a challenge at hand and it's either done or not. <laughs> and if you're, um, if you're assigning partnership deals or if you're managing a marketing budget, there are, there are results that will come of those activities. You will see a certain, you will see a certain number of contracts get signed. You will see a certain return on ad spend for marketing these things are actually quite measurable and you should, I think, be in close enough touch with your team that even without looking at a dashboard, you know what they're working on, where their challenges are, um, what they need from you and, and whatnot. Um, so I think that um, in some ways it's actually quite nice. As I, as I mentioned earlier, it's a leveler because there is no influence of who's in the office for the longest number of hours. It is what is the impact of what everyone's working on? Because if they manage to have that impact and they're only working five hours a day, I am thrilled for them. Congratulations, that's great. Um, they deserve that extra time back for themselves. If it takes them longer, then that's, that's okay too. Um, but I care much more about what they're able to achieve than how many hours they're spending doing it. Thank you. 
The next question is from Erlen Neri. How do you handle work imbalance for your team who is working remotely from home? So is it best practice to suggest or require staff who are working remotely from home to check out and complete learning topics to help fill in work gap time? So for example, LinkedIn learning. And should specific learning topics be promoted for them to choose the topic or should managers provide those suggested topics? Okay, let's keep this answer, this question up just for another second while I sure, no piece problem. through it. Um, so it sounds like this is in the context of training and employee training, because the two examples are both around learning. Um, yeah, it does seem as though this is around how can we make sure that we're training our employees to have the right skills. Um, I think it could do. Um, in my in my line of field in tech, um, I don't think it's necessary because for the most part, we're not hiring people who are completely new to the work. Um, I might be slightly out of touch though, um, because for the most part, the the level beneath me and the level beneath beneath them is they are they are fairly experienced. So we are hiring people who, for the most part, know how to do the jobs that they've been hired to do. There's always opportunities for growth and development, but a lot of that in in my world is coming from the mentorship, the observation of the person in front of you. It's a little bit more of an apprenticeship model um, than it is, you know, here are some things that you need to learn. I think that changes when um, you're talking about bringing in people um, who might be entry level and it changes when you're talking about people changing the teams or um, the, uh, basically the skills that are required for them. So if that's the case, then I can see learning being really valuable um, and absolutely I think doing it online is a, is a great way to do it we're all figuring out how to learn in a remote environment of course we're, we're Yale alumni and even Yale itself and, and all the other universities are are doing learning in a remote context and so I think it can be done and um, learning is is great if that's the if in certain contexts next question is from Chris hi Catherine Interesting to hear that scale is a challenge for fully distributed teams and yet more location flexibility is also demanded when single office companies get larger. I'm thinking that this means fast growing companies just need a particular caliber of HR leadership. Any comments on that? Um, and yet more location flexibility is also demanded. I think that depends. Um, sorry, I'm just reading it again. Sure, no problem. Certainly, fast-growing companies need a certain caliber of everything, not just HR, but they have specific challenges. And I love fast-growing companies. Um, it's such a pleasure. The challenges that they face are ones of opportunity and how you can best capture it. But there are still challenges, and they are... Um, sometimes fairly predictable, especially if you've been through that kind of hockey stick growth before. Um, you know that certain systems and processes are going to break pretty quickly. As an example, when I joined Facebook, um, all hiring was tracked in a single Excel spreadsheet. And you can only have, I think technically maybe up to 25 or 24 people in that spreadsheet at a time. And you can imagine that the company at that time was about 3,500 employees the chances that you would exceed that limit was almost 100%. So we had managers who were trying to figure out who they could hire, where, where things were in the hiring pipeline, but getting up at one in the morning so that they could check that sheet when no one else was in there. I mean, these are basic things, but um, when companies are growing that rapidly, you have certain scaling problems. And I think, yes, you want the HR leadership to be ready for them, but you want, kind of want all the leadership to be ready for them too. Um, because these kinds of problems will crop up everywhere. Um, and then the other part of the question, more location flexibility is demanded. Um, yeah, I think that, again, we're talking about what size, but at some point, um, as we were talking about with the Google or the Facebook example, you do get too big for everybody to be in a meeting and to be able to get from each meeting to another, even if you're talking about a single office building in New York City, which I also experienced when I was at Random House, you would think that at least you're just getting in an, in an elevator, but then the elevators at the half hour marks and the one hour marks start to have a line and you have the same problem. 
it still will end up taking you sometimes up to 15 minutes to commute between meetings, even though they're just a couple floors up. You have people taking the fire escape. You just, scaling is hard. Companies will need to experience their growing pains, try to anticipate them and get ahead of them. But um, there will be growing pains and it's a good problem to have. Okay, great. The next question is from Tanya Whiteking. I hope I said her last name correctly. Uh, I hear other managers say, as you have, that it's important to be well -round, a well-rounded and well-rested individual and that it's important to set boundaries. Um, however, as soon as you say something like, well, ultimately it's about results, you're already undermining the standards and values you claim to place on free time and boundaries because no one can define how much is really enough. We all know that we can work around the clock and still have things that have been left undone. One of the lessons we might learn from the COVID-19 situation is that to be endlessly productive is leading to strife and burnout. Can you envision a way of cultivating a culture in a company where working less can lead to business success? And what would it take to achieve this? So thank you, Tanya, for asking the question. Clearly, I needed to clarify my earlier remark. I, I believe in results, but more is not always more. So I believe in a certain amount of productivity from my team members. I know roughly what it takes to say, sign five partnership deals in a quarter. And I'm not going to assign more than that as any kind of expectation. A lot of this reasonable goal setting takes place early before the quarter begins so that you can come up with goals that are both achievable and also in the best interests of the company. They wanna be slightly stretch goals, but um, they need to be something that doesn't require people working nights and weekends. If they're working, <laughs> if you require nights and weekends, you have no buffer for anything that actually goes wrong. <laughs> so it's not just bad for the team, which is bad for the company, but it's also bad for the company because if you need your team to be working those kinds of hours, you're not prioritizing well enough or you're not hiring enough. You're doing something wrong. So I think it's really important to have standards and to expect strong results from your employees, but they need to also be achievable and reasonable. Great, okay. So we have um, about six minutes left, so we're gonna take maybe two, maybe three more questions. Um, so the next question is uh, from an anonymous person. Uh, what is your advice for those in the nonprofit world for whom this remote world is all new? And what about entrepreneurs? Um, I may not have enough experience with the not-profit world, not-for-profit world, to know how things would be different. Um, I think this advice probably changes more depending on the size of the company and the, um, the scale that we're talking about than it does on whether it's, it's a for-profit business or a not-for-profit. So I would imagine that this is this is similar, that the application will be different. For example, if you're fundraising, fundraising for a private but for-profit company is a very different experience <laughs> than I'm sure it is for a not-for-profit. Um, but ultimately, it's a very similar, um, at its core activity, you're trying to convince someone to entrust you with money. Um, I know that um, in Silicon Valley, there's a bit of a, oh my gosh, what does this mean? Um, so for entrepreneurs, now is a tough time to raise money because so many VCs that were thinking about the next big deal over the next few months are very focused on helping their portfolio companies, the ones they've already made investments in, get through these tough times. Some of the portfolio companies may do, be doing really well, for example, if they're in e-commerce or maybe if they're in um, remote healthcare um, appointment booking <laughs> software. There are some industries that are actually doing really well right now. Um, and then there are lots that are absolutely struggling. So for example, if you're a startup in the travel space or in the um, event planning space, if you're, <laughs> if you're planning large gatherings of people, um, this, these are tough times. And so um, I think that a lot of um, VCs are trying to figure out what this means uh, for the companies that they've already committed to helping succeed. I wouldn't be surprised though, if in another sort of three to six months, um, a lot of VCs start to open back up and look at what's out there. And a lot of the best companies actually get funded during down markets because um, that's when 
that's when you get the greatest commitment. That's when you get to see the companies that really do have something there in terms of product market fit, something that customers are already excited about. This, the, the times are, when the times are harder, the standards are higher, and that's when some of the best companies come to be founded. And remember that a lot of these VCs still have tons of money and they have to deploy that capital. And so um, there's still money to be had. And I think they, that while yes, the times are harder um, for certainly creating something new, um, there will be lots of people to hire, lots of money, lots of VCs you can raise from, and um, it will be different, but still possible. Excellent, okay. I think we have time for one more question. And I, I like this question because I think it's a, a great way to end. Uh, this question is from Cynthia Taub. On a bad hair day, is it rude not to turn on video to join your team meeting? In other words, how do you present your best self remotely? Um, you know, this has happened to me before. <laughs> I think this is, this is pretty amusing. Um, but certainly there's the moment when you get up and you have a really early morning Zoom call and you haven't really taken a lot of time to look at what you look like before you just sign on. And then you see yourself, because in Zoom, you usually do see yourself, and you're just like, oh, man. And what I usually do is I just apologize. <laughs> just apologize. And you know what? That, that's fine. Like we're, <laughs> um, We don't always have to look beautiful or even okay. I never have great hair days. It's just, it's just what I was born with. So it's untrue. Um, it's untrue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and, uh, and you know, that's, it's okay in a way. I'll just pretend I'm making it okay for everyone else to have a bad hair day too. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, we're going to stop there um, in the interest of time. So, uh, and I'm sorry, we weren't, we weren't able to get to everyone's questions, um, but we do like to begin and end on time. So I would like to just thank all of the participants who joined us this evening for your your attention and your questions and for spending this hour of your evening with us. Um, I'd like to thank Catherine and Grace for a fascinating conversation on remote work. And I also wanna let everyone know that a recording of this webinar will be shared tomorrow on the Accelerate Yale LinkedIn page uh, and on the fa Facebook page and on our newly launched YouTube channel. And Yale Women and Careers Life in Yale will also be sharing this recording. I also wanted to mention that the YAA today launched a new mentoring, uh, uh, community building and networking platform called Cross Campus. This allows students and alumni to connect to each other. So alumni and alumni can connect to each other and alumni can connect to students and vice versa. That platform is called Cross Campus. And I would encourage everyone here to sign up for that. Um, it's free. It's, and you can find that at crosscampus.yale.edu. That's crosscampus.yale.edu. I've already tried it and it's a lot of fun. And finally, uh, we have another webinar coming up next week. Uh, please join us next Tuesday, April 14th at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, just like tonight. Uh, and that webinar will be with Jacob Mullins, who is class of 05, and he is a partner at Shasta Ventures. I see that Catherine knows him. And he will be discussing a VC's perspective on the current COVID-19 landscape. And he will be in conversation with another Accelerate Yale co-founder, Chris Brady, who is also class of 05. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for their time, uh, especially Catherine and Grace. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Good night. All right. Bye-bye.